Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a new and very relevant event of the Observatorio de la Lengua Española y las Culturas Hispánicas in Los Estados Unidos. A research uh, center, which as most of you know, is a joint project between the, uh, the Instituto Cervantes and Harvard University. We are very happy and greatly honored to host this event, which celebrates the launch of the special issue devoted to the new selection of young Spanish language novelists made by the prestigious literary journal from Cambridge University, Grantham. <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, Valerie Miles, who has taken care of the edition of the special issue, and Prue Rowlandson, publicity director of Grantham Publications, for having contacted the Observatorio, suggesting this session which coincides with the launch of the issue in English in the United States. I would also like to thank my colleague, Ignacio Peiro, director of the Cervantes Center in London, for putting us in contact and also contributing to making this uh, event possible. And let me greet uh, the uh, Consul General of Mexico in Boston, Alberto Fierro. Hello, Alberto. Thank you for being with us again today. And also my colleague, the director of the Instituto Cervantes in Utrecht in, in, in Holland, uh, Pilar Tena. Thank you, Pilar, for being with us. Now, this session is an opportunity for us to meet three of these new young writers. So we, are, we, we have today with us a, an Argentine writer, a Cuban and a Mexican writer, all of whom have connections with the US. They will be introduced by Valerie Miles and they will share their literary experiences and their work with all of us. The session, as you can hear, will take place mostly in English, but we would like to invite you all to uh, make any suggestions, ask any questions in either English or Spanish through the chat so that we can share your, 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 your questions and comments with our writers in the Q&A uh, section, which will take place after the writer's presentations and discussion. So we can start now and we're going to, to do so. We're going to start by watching a video with Gr which Granta has prepared for us yep. as a kind of introduction of uh, this special issue. Hmm? now Valerie Miles to you all, who is the, has been, as I said before, the editor of this special issue and who will act as moderator of the session. Valerie Miles is a British editor, writer and translator who co-founded Granta's literary journal in Spanish in 2003. She also established the New York Review of Books classic series in Spanish and she curated the exhibition dedicated to, Ricardo, to, sorry, to Roberto Bolaño's archive papers and edited his posthumous work. 
She teaches translation and, and creative writing at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. And she has written collaborations for the New York Times, the New Yorker, El País, the Paris Review, and is the author of the volume, A Thousand Forests in One Acre, which is an anthology of Spanish language fiction of the 20th century, which she published in 2014. Valerie lives in Barcelona in Spain, and she's actually joining us from there. So welcome to the Observatorio, Valerie. Thank you so much for all the, the work done to make this possible. And you have the floor now. Thank you so much, Marta, uh, for the invitation to be here. I want to thank very, very especially the Cervantes Institute, um, who has uh, hosted us in a number of different places and been so generous um, with this uh, exploration that we've been making in the Spanish language. So um, a, a great shout out to them. I'd like to also thank Diana Sorensen for um, inviting us to be here. Um, very generous uh, host and for welcoming us um, to, to talk today. Um, I also really want to thank Sigurd Rousing for her constant encouragement. Um, she's taken, when she took uh, Granta over in 2000, 2006, she had a vision for the magazine to bring it um, into more of an international conversation. And um, you know, the Spanish uh, edition was the first of the international editions. And um, so she's been a constant encouragement in that, uh, in that area. And also the granted team with whom you know, I worked very, very, very closely. Um, we've worked together for so many years, but this time it, it, it was a little bit different. I usually am working in, only in Spanish. And this time, since I edited, first the Spanish, and then also edited the English. Uh, I was the guest editor of the English edition. We uh, had a very intense several months working together. And it was, I had the time of my life. They're a marvelous editorial team. And uh, I enjoyed working with them very much. And um, finally, uh, there are two more uh, groups that I really need to thank, which is the translators, um, some of whom are here with us today. Um, you know, that we made sure that the translators' names were also placed in the Spanish language edition quite precisely because uh, translators are often also editors of texts. And so, you know, in the first stage of this project, I was working with the editors and editing with them their texts in Spanish. But then it went to the translators and the translators, you know, because they have to be so, um, I, you know, I, I like George Steiner's uh, theory on the hermeneutic motion. So they, they have to get in there and kind of tear everything apart and then, then put it back together again. And um, they often see and catch things and fine tune in ways that make them editors, not only translators. And so I felt even, I felt they need to be visible also in the Spanish edition, because their work, it was like a ping pong. When they would find something in English, we'd go back to the writer in the Spanish, then we'd go back to the English. And, and so that helped um, through the, the editorial process to fine tune um, these texts. So they need to be um, seen also in the Spanish because their work is there too. And finally, the jury um, who helped us select this, the group of writers, the three writers that we have here today. Um, so I just, uh, to let everyone know a little bit how we're, we're going to organize ourselves today, I'm going to just give a, a brief um, introduction to Granta, the Granta the, ma the literary magazine, um, then also to the Spanish edition of Granta when we started, and then to this issue specifically. Then we're going to hear from the three writers here with us today, Mateo García Lizondo, Michel Nieva, and Benedis Machado Vento. They're going to we'll have a little bit of a conversation. They'll talk about the texts that are in this issue. And then um, also uh, they're going to, each one is going to read. They're going to read in the original Spanish and Joseph who is here with us will read um, the English translation. So that's a little bit how we're going to have it today. And then we hope that you'll um, send in questions because we'll be, we'll, we're leaving a, a good amount of time so that we can have a, a nice conversation with the people who are joining us today. So, 
Um, I can finally, before getting into the history of Granta, just for a moment, I would like to also let everyone know that uh, we are launching, this is the launch of the Granta's issue number 155, the best of young Spanish novelists um, two <laughs> in English. It's now available in English in the United States. And uh, the Spanish language edition um, will be available on the 29th of May in vintage. Um, so that edition is, is yet to come in Spain and Latin America. We've been very happily working with Candaya um, who have made an absolutely marvelous edition also in Spanish. Um, and I just want to mention also that there's an audible edition for anyone who'd like to listen um, to this issue, which I suggest very strongly also because um, it's in the original Spanish and you have a chance to really be immersed in the, the richness of the different registers of the Spanish that are here. Um, I work very closely also with Audible to make sure that the voices were in keeping with the, the, each one of the voices of the writers. Um, and so they're all spot on. Um, and also I want to say that we have an Italian edition coming out very shortly in WordBridge. So, so we still have, it, it's still uh, rolling. Now, uh, Granta, what is Granta? Um, I know Marta asked me to give a little bit of a background because uh, there are a lot of students with us that may not yet know what Granta is. Um, Granta is a literary magazine that was founded in 1889 in Cambridge University. Um, it was a student magazine um, that uh, was writing a little bit of uh, badinage and uh, a little bit of um, you know chronic chronicles of what you know of student life in Cambridge, um, a lot of uh, a lot of satirical pieces, et cetera, et cetera. But that it continued um, over the years, uh, and several it gave rise to several um, very important writers like Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes in one period of time, but also A.A. Uh, a. Milne, Winnie the Pooh's <laughs> creator was writing for um, Granta, Conan Doyle. Um, many, many writers have kind of gone through Granta. Um, but in 1979, Granta was re-founded by uh, a couple of um, American editor, uh, American students who came to Cambridge and they were, uh, you know, very, I guess you could say rowdy. <laughs> they, they, they wanted to kind of break up establishment. And they had this idea that in, in England, England wasn't reading um, American writers. And they thought that somebody had to, 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 to end that uh, kind of wall between that transatlantic wall. So um, in a very, in a flourish, they started publish took Granta over and started trying to break to open this conversation with um, between British and American writers. And so, but but they were very uh, <laughs> in Span in Spanish we say guerrilleros, right? They were very warrior like. And so one of the first things they did was, if I don't know if you can see this here, they declared the end of the English novel. Okay, a couple of young Americans in Cambridge, <laughs> right? So they just kind of just blew everything out of the water. Um, so Granta became really kind of the place that everyone had to be because they were making it, they were breaking paradigms, they were uh, you know, coming up with new things and they were introducing a whole new tradition into um, to the, the British scene at the time. What they did though, after uh, they declared the end of the English novel and got everyone very upset, is they decided to launch the best of young British novelists issue. And that issue uh, became, is an iconic issue now um, that found some of the most important writers of that uh, generation, like Salman Rushdie, Kazuo Ishiguro, Martin Amis, Julian Barnes, Ian McEwen, uh, Pat Barker, um, Rosemary Tremaine, several, several of the writers that now 
uh, we all know. So that was the first time that Granta ever did an operation like the best of young. And that was in 1983, actually, that that came out. Um, shortly after they did the best of young British novelists, uh, they then came up with the dirty realism issue that most everyone, it's, it's another iconic issue. When you go back over um, Granta's issues, you find many issues are now iconic pieces of literary history of British literary history, but also of this transatlantic conversation that they were building. Over the years, this was you know, during the time of Bill Buford and Pete Dabala um, and uh, Jonathan Levy, um, they you know, worked for several years. Um, but then Ray Hederman, who is the director, the owner the, uh, of New York Review of Books, took Granta over and uh, kind of made this, that transatlantic conversation continue. Um, and it, it became a very fundamental part of what Granta is. Um, over the years, Spanish Granta was launched in 2003 with uh, Ray Hederman um, when he was uh, overseeing Granta. One of the other things that Granta was very, very uh, known for is how much they were working in translation. They were publishing writers from all over the world. Very specifically, there was a conversation with Eastern European writers. And this is you know, during the time of the Iron Curtain. Um, as a matter of fact, they published uh, uh, Svetlana Alexievich way before anyone was reading her, uh, her work. Um, they, and they published many, many different Nobel Prizes over the years, long before there were Nobel Prizes, right? Um, but during that period of time, they were also publishing a lot of Spanish writers. They were publishing Reinaldo Arenas. They were publishing Gabriel García Márquez. They were publishing Mario Vargas Llosa. They were publishing Donoso. They were publishing um, uh, Sergio Ramírez, for example. There's an, in an issue, there's a, an interview between the Cervantes Prize winner, Sergio Ramírez, and uh, Christopher Hitchens. And I, I don't remember which year, but I think it's in, uh, in the 80s sometime. So for a long time, they were doing that. Um, and there was a, a period of time when uh, they started kind of, you know, things change, people change, um, people come and they go. And the editors, uh, Bill Buford left, new people came in and there was less, um, less of a drive and less knowledge of Spanish language literature. So if you go into the history of Granta, from 1993 to 2003, there are hardly any translations from the Spanish. So uh, I was contacted one time by one of the dirty, the dirty realists, Richard Ford, who it was, has lo was long very close to um, Granta. And he mentioned to me that the editors were looking for you know, somebody that could help let them know a little bit more about what was happening in the Spanish language world because they were very unconnected. Um, and so after, you know, a long time of kind of discussions and negotiations, figuring out how we could do it, we finally did launch Granta, the Spanish Granta in 2003. Um, and uh, Sigrid Rousing came in in 2006 and she had this, like I said, this enormous vision that um, the Spanish edition was beginning to work very well and that she wanted to see if we could somehow um, spread that so that the Spanish granta came in to, to build a dialogue between the Spanish language and the English language literatures and find out what each one was doing and share our writers um, but also the Spanish language is, you know, one of the other great transatlantic languages. And for us, from, from the Spanish language, we knew that there wasn't enough conversation either between Spanish writers and Latin American writers. And not only Latin American writers and Spanish writers, but also Latin American writers among themselves, you know, weren't so much reading each other. So we wanted to build this platform and have this place where we would be able to emulate the work that, that Granta English had been doing in the English language in the Spanish language, and at the same time, share um, between the languages, the, the writers. So um, Sigrid 
it encouraged us to continue working, you know, working in that line. And eventually, uh, a Brazilian granta was started um, in Alfawada um, because that's where I was working at the time. And uh, then slowly but surely, uh, a, a Spanish um, woman, Gloria Masdeu, went to China and started working at, in China. And Gloria Masdeu started a, a granta in Chinese. Um, so the, the Spanish granta has had kind of a lot of different um, uh, partners uh, co coming through the Spanish language, right? Um, but then eventually uh, Spanish started, the granta started growing into a number of different languages. So what started as a dialogue between Spanish, or between English and uh, Spanish turned into a conversation. So now it's a, a large conversation among many editors and many languages. So how does that bring us to our list? And we had, since we were at you know, 2003, we launched. By 2010, we had sort of proven ourselves. <laughs> and so that we figured that was the right time to launch our first list. We did that in 2010. And uh, we had we ended up selecting 22 writers, um, and the 22 writers we kind of emulated again what uh, Granta did with its first list. We we got lucky. I don't know. We had good taste. I don't know what it is, but we uh, were able to discover some voices for. Um, for the British Granta that uh, hadn't been translated yet or weren't quite very well known, um, like writers like uh, Pola Oloisharak or Samantha Schweblin or um, Alejandro Zambra or Andres Neumann, Andres Barba, Elvira Navarro, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, uh, so we knew in 2010 that we had 10 years of work ahead of us in order to be able to come to 2020 and begin working on our, our second list. Um, so this is now our second list. Um, and of course we could never have imagined in 2010 that we would be in the middle of a pandemic as we were starting to do the list. Um, but we, uh, we did, we had adapt ourselves very quickly and uh, launch a digital, um, a digital project in order so the candidacies could come in digitally and uh, the jury we had a very um, a very prestigious jury with uh, with Rodrigo Fresan um, with Horacio Castellanos Moya the two uh, the two novelists Chloe Arigis who happened to win the Penn Faulkner award uh, as we uh, as we were um, beginning uh, our reading process, Gabby Wood from the Booker Foundation, Aurelio Major, um, the poet and co-founder of uh, Spanish Granta, and of course I chaired the, the jury, and um, so we spent some time deliberating for a while, and uh, we had the idea that we were going to choose 20 writers, um, and try and limit it to 20 writers because we understand that our work as the selection for the selection of Granta is not necessarily to state uh, or a list of people who are writing, but actually make a selection, which is a little bit more of a painful process. Um, and of course, uh, as we were reading, all of us had to sacrifice writers that we really liked um, in order to come to a consensus. Um, in the introduction, I say it's kind of like playing the Ouija, you know, a Ouija board when you kind of all start working together and it ends there and that's, and that's the selection. So it's kind of a music of chance, as I said the other day. Um, the, the selection ended up being 25 writers. The difference between the selection in 2010 is that we, there were only eight countries represented and this 2021 um, list has 13 countries represented. Uh, the list in 2010 had only five women. And this list has 11 women, more than double. Um, we have, uh, there was some of this, the differences, I guess you could say is that um, we went from one to four writers in Mexico. And there was a sudden 
uh, eruption of a new generation of Cuban writers that uh, impressed all of us very, very, very much. Um, so it's a, it's a very exciting list. It's a very diverse list. We have a writer from uh, Equatorial Guinea on the list, which opened, actually added another continent. Um, so it's not three continents, it's four continents. And we were very, very uh, happy to, to have found Estanislao Medina Huesca because he, he opens a window on, uh, on a, uh, an experience that is taking place in the Spanish language that he's able to share. Um, the jury together, I guess you could say, um, what we were, I, I will just read a little, um, little couple of lines from my introduction to say exactly what we were looking for. And then I think it's time for us to pass on now to the writers and listen to them. But this is what, what we were looking for. And these, this is what these writers who are going to be talking now delivered. We wanted work of the imagination, fiction, consciousness captured on the page, storytelling, no essay, no memoir, no reportage, no selfies with a bit of Photoshop to pass it off as fiction. Story that's peeled away from the merely testimonial, from the very tiresome use and abuse of the first person. Originality, attitude, yeah, attitude. Writers writing like their lives depended on it. Writers writing about things I had no idea I was interested in. Writers channeling the worlds of the inarticulate who have not spoken for those themselves or whom we cannot hear. Things that are familiar, made strange or re-enchanted. Writers like the ones who came before, the ones who didn't know about Instagram, writers who are not readers, but re-readers. <laughs> so I think the best thing we can do now is hear these voices uh, that we have with us today. Um, first, we're going to move the three writers we have. I will introduce them one by one, but their names are Mateo Garcia Lizondo, Daenerys Machado, uh, uh, Mateo is from Mexico, Daenerys Machado Vento is from Cuba, and Michel Nieva, who is from Argentina. So uh, we'll begin with Mateo, who I'm going to read his uh, biography. And uh, Mateo worked with Robin Myers as his translator, um, who did an absolutely marvelous job. Mateo Garcia Elizondo was born in Mexico City. He wrote the film Desierto, and has written for magazines such as Nexus, as well as graphic novel scripts for Premier Comics and Entropy Magazine. His first novel, Una Cita con la Lady, won the City of Barcelona Prize or award, and it was published in Spanish by Anagrama. Mateo, um, give us a little bit of an idea of um, your poetics, the area that you work in. You work in so many different forms um, mm -hmm. but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, thank, thank you, Valerie. First of all, thank that it's a pleasure to be here uh, with Michelle and Daenerys and Valerie, and thank you so much to the Observatorio Cervantes in Harvard for having us. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, thanks, Valerie. As, as, as you mentioned, yeah, I've been uh, writing in a lot of forms and a lot of formats. Uh, I started out, I studied English literature and journalism, and I did journalism for a while, but then I got caught into uh, writing scripts for movies, and that's what I, I, I did for a lot of time. And I also, I'm, I'm a big fan of comic books, and I also got into comic books writing um, scripts for, for graphic stories. Um, but yeah, but uh, in the end, uh, narrative is uh, I, 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 in what I, what what I've always what's always been the the common pattern is that I always wanted to tell stories, and I think um, yeah, the reason that 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 
narrative prose is so interesting to me is because of the access you get to characters. Uh, in cinema, generally, <clears throat> you're always looking at characters from the outside. You are, you're always from the point of view of a camera. In graphic novels, you have thought bubbles, so it's different. But in but but narrative fiction really allows you to go into the minds and consciousness of of, of characters, and I think that's that's something I've been really interested in uh, in in the novel that I wrote a couple of years ago, when Nacita con la Lady. It was about exploring these extreme extreme and very opposed state of consciousness, and especially the place where these extreme and opposed states of consciousness meet, like waking life and dreaming and, and uh, life and death. And I think there was something similar in, in, in the story that I wanted to, that, that I wrote for, for Granta. Yeah, the um, story is, is called Capsula, right? Capsule. Tell us a little bit about the story. I think, I think there's actually a point in the story that is, you know, I know you like to work with in kind of states of altered consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and we see that in this in this specific. Um, it, a lot of your poetics are there, but it's mm -hmm. almost it almost touches a mystical mystical point. No, tell us a little bit about the story. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, the story is called Capsula, and it's the story of of a man who is sentenced to life imprisonment. And his sentence consists of being shuttled off into space inside a very small capsule forever, basically. This, this capsule will keep going through the endless void forever. And, and I think what I was interested in when I was writing this story was what happens to consciousness when it's uh, confronted to the void. As Valerie said, there was something mystical about it. On the one hand, there was something very Zen-ish about Zen, about, you know, about consciousness being the origins of consciousness, the void, and this, this sort of unfiltered contact with the totality of, 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 of reality. And that, that was uh, part of what I was interested in. Um, I think there was something interested in that sort of uh, state of mind which was very close to enlightenment but at the same time tra traveling in a capsule through space entails a process of social isolation and of sensory deprivation that also pushes the character very near madness and I think uh, that point where madness and enlightenment touch uh, I think there was something uh, very narratively fertile about that, those states of mind. And I think when I was writing the story, um, what I was interested in was the, both several different things, but I thought it was a very good analogy, first of all, for kind of uh, the daily human experience. We are kind of uh, these beings stuck inside small capsules and, you know, crossing this endless expanse of space and void that is that is aimless and, and meaningless and that sort of gives you this uh, existential feeling of absurdity that I wanted to explore and that I think is really, well, to me, it's terrifying and it's kind of the stuff of, of, of fiction. But I also think um, when I was writing and I was trying to write a Story where I was trying to write a prison story where a uh, physical escape was impossible from the outset. So the character would have to look for other means of escape. And I knew those other means of escape would involve uh, consciousness. And there is a point in the story in which I think the character realizes that it's not the physical space of the capsule that he needs to escape. Uh, but rather this sort of reality that is being thrust uh, upon him. And I think that's uh, a good analogy for what we do as writers and as, as, as readers, is we try to break the bonds of this very limiting reality that we're, be, we've, we're being thrust upon. So that's, that's kind of the, the experiment that I wanted to do with Capsule. Well, that's a, a very eloquent... Uh, description of the of the story and uh, the story is 
absolutely uh, marvelous. It, uh, you mm. have the character of Polycarpo, which is, is so also kind of a, a sweet, uh, a sweet side to um, the the need of like human when they're deprived, mm -hmm. look for whatever to find connection. No? But would yeah. you read us? Would you read us a, a sure. little piece? Sure, I will read you from the Spanish version, and then Joseph will read from, from Robin's translation, which is uh, really excellent. We had a lot of fun doing it, and she really renders the voice of the characters in a way that I love. So she'll be reading from uh, Robin's translation Great. Uh, shortly. Uh, wait a second. Okay. Okay. Here it comes. Por lo menos tuvieron la... Uh, yeah, I'm going to read in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Por lo menos tuvieron la decencia de instalar una ventana en la parte frontal de la cápsula. En fin, antes pensaba que era por decencia. Ahora sé que fue para torturarnos. La ventanilla da una visión panorámica sobre el universo y donde sea que ponga la mirada, la única vista posible es la de la inmensidad. Alguien que nunca ha sentido vértigo conocería la sensación si pudiera ver lo que yo veo cada vez que miro por la ventanilla de mi cápsula. A la mente le cuesta mucho digerir el infinito, por eso solo le dedicamos algunos momentos furtivos. Sabemos que un poco más sería insoportable. Yo lo tengo frente a mí a cada instante, a un metro y veinticinco centímetros de mi cara, y sé que nunca se va a ir de ahí. Me imagino que los que nos pusieron aquí creyeron que al hacernos esto nos obligarían a pensar en los crímenes atroces que cometimos. No se dan cuenta de que la visión del abismo cósmico solo confirma mi convicción de que las vidas de esos tipos eran insignificantes. Creo que los jueces no concebían bien la magnitud de nuestro castigo, porque sin importar si su conciencia lo persigue o no, el preso queda irremediablemente confrontado al vacío primordial. Y eso no es justo. No existe mente humana capaz de soportar eso. Ya quisiera verlos a ellos, tan propios ellos, con sus Golden Retrievers que sacan a pasear durante su jogging del domingo, su par de whiskies en la noche, sus liturgias y sus buenos deseos y sus conciencias limpias, impecables, tan pulcras e inmaculadas como yo ahorita tengo el culo. Ya los quiero ver aquí sentados frente a la nada, viendo a ver si no se cagan en sus pants. Se entienden cosas sobre sí mismo en la cárcel y la cápsula no es distinta. He aprendido que sucede algo muy peculiar cuando el ojo abarca el universo entero de un vistazo. La conciencia es como el agua, toma la forma de lo que observa, y le es imposible ver la inmensidad negra, vacía y limitada, sin adoptar a su vez esas cualidades. Así es como la mente del reo empieza a abarcarlo todo. Pensaban que exponiéndonos al silencio y la oscuridad nos estaban privando de estímulo. Si se hubieran sometido a nuestro castigo, aunque fuera por cinco minutos, habrían logrado entender que sucede lo opuesto. Todos los estímulos del mundo nos llegan a cada instante, y desde nuestra diminuta cápsula lo vemos todo, lo contenemos todo. Nos volvemos algo así como dioses. Thank you so much, Mateo. I want to clap, you know, but... <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, Joseph will read you the, the English version, which is... Yeah, Great. thank you so much. I hope I do it justice. <laughs> At least they have the tact to install a small window in front of the capsule, or I used to think it was out of tact. Now I know they did it to torture us. The window offers a panoramic view of the universe. No matter where you look, all you can see is vastness. Something, someone who has never experienced vertigo would understand the feeling if they looked out my capsule window. The mind struggles to grasp the infinite, which is why we can only focus on it for a few furtive moments at a time. Any more would be unbearable, but I have it right in front of me around the clock, one meter and 25 centimeters from my face, and I know it's never going anywhere. The people who put us here must have believed that we'd be forced to reflect on our heinous crimes. What they didn't realize, though, is that the sight of the abyss only confirms my conviction that the lives of the guys I killed were utterly trivial. I don't think the judges really understood the magnitude of our punishment, because whether or not your conscience is tormenting you, you're irredeemably confronted with the primordial void. And that's not right. No human mind can stand it. I'd like to see them try. Them, the very picture of respectability, their Sunday jogs with their golden retrievers, their whiskeys before bed, their liturgies and good wishes and immaculate scruples, tidy and unsullied as my ass is right now. I'd like to see them sitting here, staring out at the big nothing, trying to keep from shitting their pants. 
You learn something about yourself in prison and the capsule is no different. I've learned that something very peculiar happens when your eyes can absorb the entire universe with a single glance. Consciousness is like water. It takes the form of whatever it observes and it's impossible to look, at, to look out at the jet black immensity, empty, endless, without adopting those qualities yourself. That's how a prisoner's mind starts to encompass everything. They thought they'd be depriving us of sensory input by exposing us to silence and darkness. But what happens is the total opposite, which they might have realized if they tried subjecting themselves to this punishment for even five minutes. All the stimulus in the world, all of it, seeps into us with every passing moment. And from the smallness of our capsule, we see it all. We contain it all. We turn into something like gods. Well done. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Thank you, Matteo. Well, let's, uh, let's move to the ladies. Um, Daneris Machado de Cuba. I'm going to, to read um, her, her brief biography and introduce you. It's so lovely to have you, Daneris. Um, Daneris was born in Havana, Cuba, and is co founder of the publisher Swallows. Swallows. <laughs> One is in a Spanish uh, style. She's the author of. Las Noventa Habanas. The Color of Balloons is part of a new project called El Album de las Trentañeras. Denadis, uh, you tell us a little bit. You, you are living in Miami now. You're studying your, your last year of your PhD. Um, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about Las Noventa Habanas, when you wrote it, um, and uh, a little bit of what you're doing in your also your research project. Sure, thank you so much, Valerie, for the presentation. Thank you, of course, to the Cervantes, especially to Marta, Victoria, and Joseph, who have been like the face of this event uh, for us. I'm very pleased to be sharing this space with Mateo and, and Michelle as well. Uh, I was thinking uh, while Mateo was talking, be uh, because I, I also had a background in journalism, and I was thinking what's happening with this election. There are a lot of, uh, I mean, there are a couple more of journalists in the, in the, in Granta as well. And I think that what's happening is that at least when I, I've been questioning this myself like a lot. And uh, when I studied journalists, I remember the, um, the professors, the insistence, of, the insistence of the professor who were telling all the time that the story is the one that selects the genre, that you don't choose the, the genre that you're going to write, but the story is selecting the, the, the genre. And I think there is where the change from the journalist to the fiction happen, as Madeo was explaining. You just want to say something and let that happen. And actually in Las Noventa Habanas, which is a, a short story book, um, there are a couple of texts that I originally uh, published uh, as if they were chronicles, and then I change them and I rewrite those texts to be fiction. So uh, Las Noventa Habanas is a, a compilation of 19 short stories, uh, all take old histories, old stories take place in, in Havana in the summer of the 1990s. And most of them uh, are uh, the main character of most of those stories are women. And from that idea came then the idea of uh, kind of thinking about women like at the center of my fiction. And uh, from there comes El Album de las Trentañeras, which is the, the, the new project. Uh, and basically, uh, my interest was uh, showing that the uh, Cuban literature was possible to make using the Cuban style, using the Cuban voice. That was something that uh, I felt that uh, was kind of losing the, in the new books that were circulating uh, internationally. So that's, that's something that is there, yeah. Well, we certainly picked up on that. Um, because the jury, when we started reading you and we started reading Euris, Planche, um, and, and many of the writers from different places, we, uh, we were very um, captured and captivated by language. I think, um, you know, uh, literature is nothing more than the phenomenon of language, no? But, but the way that the writers in your generation are using language is, is well, we found at least new in the way that uh, 
you're not going far away from the, the traditions that you're writing from, no? And the voices, and, and the voices not only in dialogue, it, it's not just all of a sudden you put a little bit of a dialogue so that you hear the local voices and then you go back to the neutral Spanish, but it really is the sound of the place that you're writing from. And uh, we were, um, when we started reading you, there was, there was we noticed a breath of fresh air and, and kind of really enjoying um, even some of your cantankerous characters <laughs> which you're very good <laughs> very good <laughs> you're very good at writing um and but you're very good at character character creating these characters that are so real they're, they're absolutely real by the way they speak so tell us a little bit about uh, el color del globo or de los globos. Uh, thank you so much for your for your comment and i i took some notes here because sometimes when i'm speaking like <laughs> in public space i get nervous but so the short story is entitled The Color of Palum in Spanish, El Color del Globo. Uh, it was originally entitled Globos de Colores in Spanish. And I was glad that you were talking about how this process was like kind of ping pong game that we had the translation and then we changed something in Spanish because the objective was uh, trying to have like the most similar texts in both, uh, in both language. Um, so I had written the text before Grant has a special call for this issue was even in the horizon. I, I, I didn't think about it. And I gave the story to read to my, to my best friend who is a computer engineer. Uh, she read the story like with her husband. They are parents of two, uh, of two kids. And they waited about a week to tell me that they were very upset with me because they were trying to figure out what personal message I, I wanted to send them with the, with the short story. No, they, they felt that I was criticizing the gender reveal study that they didn't do for their kids, by the way. So, <laughs> but uh, with the color of, uh, for me, it is important to say that I, I don't always want to uh, criticize or to talk about something that is happening in society. That is not my objective uh, every time that I write, but with the color of balloon, I wanted to make visible uh, how incoherent human beings uh, can be uh, sometimes, or <laughs> when, uh, for example, caring uh, publicly, about, uh, publicly, I'm sorry, about the environment, but then uh, doing like a completely different things in, uh, privately, and also our incoherences when talking about gender, which is something that we debate all the time. And so when Grant asked for a published story, I thought, okay, it has to be the color of balloons, uh, uh, because at least I'm, I'm going to <laughs> make people get upset about the, about the story that, that it gets, no? And of course, then I gave the short story to two good friends of mine without telling them that it, it was for Granta, uh, the editor of my book, Las Noventa Habanas, uh, whose name, uh, his name is Omar Villasana and Ernesto Fundora, also an editor who has studied Cuban theater for decades because this text has a lot of, uh, of dialogue, no? So they gave me brief, the very different uh, viewpoints. And I'm telling all of this, of course, because um, sometimes writing can seem like a lonely profession, like we are only lonely all the time. I'm, it, it is in some extent, uh, but we all, I think that we also work better if we have like this kind of collaboration and, and also the kind of collaboration that Granta is now allowing us to have, because it's, as you said before, this is like a very diverse text and we are knowing all these versions of these styles of these voices from different places. Uh, and with the translation that Joseph will read after me, uh, happened the same. Will van der Hayden, who is connected uh, today with us, manages to insert into the story a, a use of Spanglish that I, I did not present in the original version. Um, I think that the original version is in Spanish. It has like some some expressions in English, but Will manages to take this like to a new dimension. And he makes this character not only preserve the mix of languages in which, in which they live, in which we live here in Miami, but actually uh, in the English versions, these characters speak Spanish, which is something that I, that I love and that Will made possible. And if I have, this is a very simple plot. It's a couple of Cuban uh, that goes that go to a, to a party, to a gender reveal party in Miami. And from there, well, from there is the short story. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Will did an excellent job at the translation and it was not easy. It was not an easy translation because it did have a lot of dialogue, but he did an absolutely excellent job at that. Um, 
would you read us a fragment of the story, please? Sure, sure, of course. I will read it as well as Mateo did in Spanish. El color del globo is the final title of the, of the, of the short story. I just want to comment that every time that I read in the introduction, when you say the writers uh, that write like those before Instagram, I laugh because the first line of my short story is referred to Instagram, but <laughs> it's part of, of a huge expression. Okay. Rogelio me vio sacar el móvil de la cartera y ya, y ya iba a comenzar a protestar porque siempre estoy metida en Instagram cuando le solté la primera pregunta que me vino a la cabeza. ¿Y cómo van a hacer el gender reveal? ¿Qué? Neutralizado. Siempre ha detestado hablar de bebés, especialmente en aquellos tiempos en que llevábamos más de seis meses templando día y noche, intentando a toda costa preñarme o que yo lo preñara si fuera el caso. Que si ya sabes cómo mi prima Lady va a revelar el sexo de su bendición, Lady no es tu prima. Obvio que quería cambiar el tema, porque él siempre ha sabido que Miami es la ciudad de los primos y que aquí primo es el primer ser humano que te deja entrar a su vida, especialmente cuando eres pobre como lo fuimos nosotros por tantos años. Oye, pero qué pesado estás, me defendí con convicción. Algo dentro de mí me decía que era un buen día para ganar todas las peleas que me diera la gana de echar. ¿Sabes o no sabes cómo será develado el sexo de la criatura? Porque mira, según Google, podríamos estar llegando a un evento altamente peligroso para nuestras vidas. Noviembre de 2019, Gender Reveal en Texas, un avión cargado de 350 litros de agua rosada, se estrelló minutos antes de avisarle a los padres que traían al mundo una nueva obrera hembra, potencialmente republicana. ¿Obrera hembra? ¿Pero a ti qué te pasa? Yo lo único que te pido es que no vayas a decir en la fiesta que estamos intentando tener un hijo. O hija, Rogelio, o hija, que no quiero camisas de fuerzas heteronormativas desde tan temprano. ¿Puedes dejar el teléfono, por favor? Iluso, estaba tratando de alejarme de mis convicciones sociales y de mis ganas de joder. ¿Por qué? Si el que está manejando eres tú. Mira, otro ejemplo. Un año antes, abril de 2018, 47 mil acres son incendiados en Arizona cuando una pareja trató de revelar con fuegos, con fuegos de colores el sexo de su obrero, otro potencial republicano. Dice la noticia que el obrero nació saludable algunos meses después, pero los bomberos gastaron 8 millones de dólares apagando la gracia de los padres. ¿Tú sabes lo que son 8 millones de dólares? No, no, tú no lo sabes. A estas fiestas les llaman White Straight Culture, hashtag cultura de blanquitos heteronormativos con globos, mijita, con globos no seas tan dramática, por favor ¿cómo dices o come mierda? pensé el vocativo, pero no se lo dije dejé mi pregunta ahí, en el ¿cómo dices? de la mínima decencia, Lady va a ser su gender reveal con globos de colores rellenos de helios que van a salir de una caja si los globos son rosados, tendrán una hembra, si son azules, tendrán macho, mi marido fingía paciencia ¿Me estás diciendo que la muy hija de puta va a matar tres o cuatro aves en extinción que se van a comer el plástico de los globos pensando que son comida? Rogelio me miró a los ojos tratando de fulminarme, saboreé mi potencial victoria y volví a la carta. Si es que da igual, mi amor, ya sobrepasaron la idea de hacerse un aborto. Si tienen como siete meses cargando con la bendición, que seguro también votará republicano y será amamantada exclusivamente para la foto de Instagram. Mira, hashtag amamantar en público es un derecho, hashtag quiero dar la teta con sudor, jodida pero contenta. No, pero qué tensa te ponen los gender reveal, mija. Te pido por favor que dejes el teléfono. No, evoqué mi mejor tono de defensora de los derechos humanos. Si aquí voy a revisar ahora mismo mi calendario de ovulaciones y te aviso que esta noche tenemos que templar otra vez que estoy en mis días buenos. No me hables de eso, coño, que se me quitan las ganas de llegar a la fiesta. ¿Qué diré yo? Con mi licenciatura en biología y mi máster en políticas de género. Y con mis ganas de joder, debía agregar. No tengo ningún deseo de llegar a esa puta oda al binarismo capitalista, donde a nadie le importa la pila de pájaros que se van a morir asfixiados igual si se comen un globo azul o uno rosado. Y yo te pregunto, Rogelio, si esa criatura que está en camino no es niña ni niño, ¿de qué color van a ser esos globos? Muy bien. Thank you so much, Daenerys. That that's uh, that's wonderful, and I think anyone can can hear, you know, like the 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 Cuban uh, accent. It's fantastic. Um, Joseph, would you read yeah, in of course. the translation? Will's marvelous translation. Rogelio saw me take my phone out of my purse and was about to start complaining that I was always on Instagram. So I shot him the first question that came into my head. So how are they going to do the gender reveal? What? neutralized. He's always hated talking about babies, especially in those days when we'd spend more than six months fucking day and night trying any way we could to get me pregnant or for him to get me or for me to get him pregnant, if that's what it came to. I asked if you know how my prima is going to do the reveal, re, how 
my prima is going to reveal the sex of her little blessing. Levi isn't your prima. Clearly he was itching to change the subject since he knows full well that Miami is the city of primos and that here a primo isn't a cousin so much as a first. El primer human being that lets you into their life, especially when you're poor as we had been for so many years. Oye, why are you being so lame? I defended myself with conviction. Something told me it was a good day to win any fight I felt like picking. Do you or do you not know how the how their baby's sex is going to be revealed? I mean, Google says we're going to an event that could put our lives at serious risk. November 2019, gender reveal in Texas, a plane crash carrying 350 liters of pink water minutes before letting the parents know they were bringing a little female worker, potentially a Republican, into the world. Female worker? What's the matter with you? All I'm asking is that you don't say anything at the party about us trying to have a baby, be it a boy or a girl. Or non-binary, Rogelio. I don't want our baby to be put into some heteronormative straitjacket at such a tender age. Will you please put your phone down? Dream on. He was trying to distract me from my social convictions and my desire to mess with him. Why? You're the one driving. Oh, look, here's another example. A year earlier, April 2018, 47,000 acres set alight in Arizona when a couple tried to use colored fireworks to reveal the sex of their little worker, another potential Republican. It says here that their worker girl was born healthy a few months later, but that the firefighters spent $8 million putting out the flames caused by the parents' stunts. Can you even wrap your head around how much $8 million is? No, no, you can't. These kinds of parties are known as cultura de blancos at a heteronormativos, hashtag straight white culture. With balloons, mijita, with balloons. Por favor, por favor, don't be such a drama queen. What'd you say, you fucking dipshit? I only thought the vocative. I didn't actually vocalize it. I cut my question off at what'd you say, retaining a modicum of decency. Lady isn't going to do her gender reveal with helium-filled balloons that they'll let out of a box. If the balloons are pink, they're going to have a girl. If they're blue, they're going to have a boy. My husband was feigning patience. You're telling me, you're telling me, this, to this total hija de puta is going to kill off three or four endangered birds. We're going to mistake the balloons for food and choke on the plastic. Rogelio gave me a withering look. I tasted potential victory and returned to the attack. Either way, mi amor, they already passed on the idea of having an abortion. She's been carrying her little blessing around for seven months now. We'll probably vote Republican too and get press breastfed exclusively for Instagram posts. Look, hashtag nursing in public is a right. Hashtag breastfeeding no matter what. Hashtag tit sweat and all. Hashtag fucked but happy. Yo, know, wow. Gender reveal parties really get you wound up, Micha. Please, I'm begging you, put your phone away. No, I summoned my best human rights defender tone. I'm checking my ovulation calendar and looks like tonight we have to fuck again. These are my good days. Don't start with that. Coño, it makes me not want to go to the party. What can I say? With my degree in biology and my master's in gender politics and my impulse to mess with people, I should have added, I have zero desire to go to this fucking ode to capitalist binarism. None of these people give a shit that a flock of birds is going to choke to death on these balloons, be they pink or blue. And let me ask you, Rogelio, what if the baby isn't a boy or a girl? What color should the balloons be then? <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, so uh, anyone can understand, uh, perhaps by that, when the jury was, you know, deliberating, and we were in the middle of the pandemic and we, you know, it's sometimes even the darkest moments, you know, because we were reading through the times when there were total lockdowns and, you know, everything was very ominous. And suddenly there's, you know, this kind of something that comes in with humor and satire. And a lot of the writers in this issue, as opposed to the writers who seemed very serious in 2010, were, wrote from a sense of humor and uh, from using satire and using a lot of the devices that uh, that gave us a lot of relief as we were writing, as I mentioned in the in the the introduction, I'm not sure if you know because it was the pandemic, these were the kind of write this is the kind of writing that appealed to us specifically at that period of time. But uh, but we were we were very pleased to see that that humor is being used, and I think it's really interesting. Um, to think that when, when Bolaño won the Villarrutia prize, for example, one of the reasons they gave him the prize was because they said he was doing something very strange for Spanish letters, Spanish language letters, which is using humor. So it's very interesting to see that the, these generations now are, are writing and using humor in a different way. Um, and, and that is a change and that is a, a, an interesting trend, which is a great segue into Michel. Nieva, um, so now it'll be, uh, I, I, I'm going to introduce you and it's going to be wonderful to hear you also read. Michel Nieva, Nieva was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He's the author of the poetry collection, uh, Papelera de Reciclaje, the novels, 
sueñan los, los gauchoides con ñandúes eléctricos and ascenso y apogeo del imperio argentino and the essay, essay collection, new tecnología y barbarie. Um, and I remember when your, uh, your novel about the gauchoides came in and we were all very impressed. Of course, we saw, we saw the Philip Kavik there very clearly. Um, and the fact that you were using genres that are uh, very unusual and that you actually yourself um, call gaucho punk. I was thinking, would you explain to us a little bit about gaucho punk? Um, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about um, your influences too in, in Philip Kadik and because, because Mateo also is, mentions Philip Kadik as, as an influence and a little bit about your writing. Yes, sure. Thank you, Valerie. Um, and thank you all the members of the Observatorio Cervantes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm also pleased to share the presentation with Inéris and Mateo. And about the, um, the Gaucho Panca, I will say that it came to me by accident because in, in high, school, high school I had to read the Domingo Faustino Sarmiento's uh, Facundo, that is a, a can canonical treatise about the uh, Pampas lowlands in Argentina. Uh, for me, it was really boring. And at that moment, uh, moment I was absorbing a lot of uh, cyberpunk literature as uh, Philip K. Dick, um, also Octavia Butler, um, a lot of uh, science fiction writers. And the, the way to make more friendly this reading, I imagine that the Pampas were uh, a dystopic uh, future uh, where gauchos and indigents were robots. And uh, I presented a, a work in high school about that uh, mixture. And of course, I, I got a, a terrible grade. Uh, but later, I, I realized that there was um, an interesting mixture between gender. Um, and I'm also yes, interested in, 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 the, um, in the figures of, and the themes of cyberpunk uh, to explore the, the history of uh, political violence in, in Argentina and Latin America, uh, how these certain figures, uh, zombies and, and robots that are in, in the crevices of uh, that are in the limit of a, a human and non-human life and non-life can, uh, can work to think uh, also how the, the colonial and racial violence uh, build the, what is the limit between, between human and non-human and life and, and non-life. And with that, that idea, I started, uh, yes, my, my writing, Sueña uh, Gaucho es Coñandoes Eléctricos. That is the story of a, um, a robot uh, made in China with uh, the idea they had of what was a, a gaucho. Um, and yes, that's uh, like my, my, my writing style. Well, you know, uh, of course, you had uh, uh, Rodrigo Fresan uh, as a complete fan. Um, he, he really loved your work, and, and so did I, but of course, he's, he's a you know, an expert in, in Philip K. Dick. So, you know, you can't go much further than that. Um, but tell us a little bit more too about this specific uh, piece that you wrote, El Niño Dengue, which was translated by Natasha Wimmer. Very, of course, uh, deftly translated by her. Um, and I, that's one of the pairings, you know, with the, with the translators. I, I, I had Natasha immediately um, in mind with, for this piece, um, especially, well, you know, because for her translation of Bolaño and, uh, I, I, and how much Bolaño loves Dick, I, I saw it all kind of together. And um, tell us a little bit about the piece. Yes, sure. The story started with a, a different exploration uh, different from the one I came that was like, more like a cartographic exploration because first uh, I like uh, 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 did a, a map uh, with a illustrator uh, but uh, I wanted to, to imagine a future um, where um, yes where when when the climate change uh, melted the, the Antarctic ice sheet and how that could impact uh, Argentina and how also the extractivism processes in Argentina could impact that future. And I started to, to imagine the story with, with this illustrator first, uh, um, yes, uh, drawing this map 
that, that shows like Argentina in the future that the Pampa Lowlands were inundated and, and transformed in, in, in beaches. And in that context, it appeared the, the story of El Niño Dengue, a Dengue Boy, that is a, a story about a character that is a, a mutant between a kid and a mosquito infect, infected by the Dengue virus. That is a, an infection that is a born mosquito disease. And that's how I, I started the story. And uh, about the work with Natasha Wimmer, uh, I was really nervous. Well, she's a, an awesome translator, but uh, because my text is plagued with a lot of uh, jargon, Argentinian jargon, um, and I was remembering a story uh, I was these days, uh, Borges said that uh, uh, when in the German translation, he wrote the uh, Sheol of Kuro, that he, he was um, addressing how in the Pampas, the, the horses with dark skin are, are, are called, and the translator uh, translate the, the, the sunset began. He thought that Oscuro was the sunset. Uh, so I, I, I never worked with an English translator, and I thought there were going to be a lot of misunderstandings like that, but uh, incredibly, Natasha Wimmer understood perfectly all the, the subtleties of of the sounds of this jargon and, and the sense. And it was amazing to see like a completely different text with the like with the original sense, but like a completely new story, much better than the one in Spanish. So <laughs> it was really, really outstanding. Yes, her work. Uh, she only made me like uh, three three questions about some uh, uh, yes uh, games with words, but the, the rest was like completely perfect. So mm -hmm. it was really amazing to work with her. And uh, there's there's an interesting uh, kind of political satire also. No, I mean you're you're it's you studied philosophy, and so you're you're coming at you know kind of even maybe using different genres um, like a comic book, uh, science fiction, even a little bit of manga and kind of all put together. Um, but yet there's an, an underpinning that is like a political satire from a philosopher, a, a philosopher, a philosopher's mind, I guess you could say. Um, tell us a little bit about how, how you, how you put that all together. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I was trained in philosophy at the University of Buenos Aires, but I always read the literature by, in an auto, autodidactic manner, and uh, I'm really interested in biopolitics. And so I found like uh, the science fiction as a as a biopolitical device to to try to peruse uh, some uh, context of political violence in, in the history of Argentina, and that's how I mix uh, uh, my philosophical interests is with with literature. Mm -hmm. um, and and with a little bit of tongue in cheek, all the time. Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> um, would you read a little fragment for us, please? Yes, sure. I will read in Spanish, and then Joseph will read it in English. Uh, I will read the, the beginning of the text. It's just a really brief excerpt, so you understand like, uh, the history of the, of the character. And, and it's called El Niño Dengue. Nadie quería al Niño Dengue. No sé si por su largo pico o por el zumbido constante, insoportable, que producía el roce de sus alas y desconcentraba al resto de la clase, lo cierto es que en el recreo, cuando los chicos salían disparados al patio y se juntaban a comer un sándwich, conversar y hacer chistes, el pobre niño Dengue permanecía solo, adentro del aula, en su banco, con la mirada perdida, fingiendo que revisaba con suma concentración una página de sus apuntes para disimular el inocultable bochorno que le produciría salir y dejar en evidencia que no tenía ni un solo amigo con quien hablar. Se corrían muchos rumores sobre, sobre su origen. Algunos decían que, por las condiciones infectas donde vivía la familia, en un rancho con latas oxidadas y neumáticos en los que se acumulaba agua de lluvia podrida, se había incubado una nueva especie mutante, insecto de proporciones gigantescas, que había violado y embarazado a la madre luego de haber matado a su marido de una forma horrenda. Otros, en cambio, sostenían que el insecto gigante habría violado y contagiado al padre 
quien a su vez, al eyacular adentro de la madre, habría engendrado a ese ser inadaptado y siniestro y que, al bardo recién nacido, los abandonó a ambos, desapareciendo para siempre. Muchas otras teorías, que ahora no vienen al caso, se comentaban sobre el pobre niño. Lo cierto es que, cuando sus compañeritos, ya aburridos, reparaban en que el niño dengue se había quedado solo en el aula, haciendo que hacía la tarea, lo iban a molestar. Che, niño dengue, ¿es cierto que a tu mamá la violó un mosquito? Eu, bicho, ¿qué se siente ser el hijo de la chele podrida de un insecto? Che, mosco inmundo, ¿es cierto que la concha de tu vieja es una zanja rancia de gusanos y cucarachas y otros bichos y que por eso de ahí saliste vos? Inmediatamente las antenitas del niño dengue empezaban a temblar de rabia y de indignación y los pequeños hostigadores escapaban entre risotadas, dejando de vuelta al niño dengue solo, sorbiendo su dolor. No era mucho más agradable la vida del niño dengue cuando volvía a su casa. Su madre, él juzgaba, lo consideraba un fardo, una aberración de la naturaleza que le había arruinado para siempre. Una madre soltera con un hijo... Bien, criar un hijo solo es difícil, pero al cabo de los años, el niño dará satisfacciones a la madre que justificarán con creces su esfuerzo. Eventualmente el niño será un joven y después un adulto que podrá acompañar y ayudar y mantener económicamente a la madre, quien, ya mayor, recordará con nostalgia el hermoso pasado compartido y se llenará de orgullo por el logro de su primogénito. Pero un hijo mutante, un niño dengue, este es un monstruo que habrá que alimentar y cargar hasta la muerte. Un extravío de la genética, cruza enferma de humano e insecto que, frente a la mirada asqueada de propios y ajenos, solo producirá vergüenza, pero que nunca, jamás de los jamases, dará ni un logro ni una satisfacción a la madre. Por eso, él juzgaba, la madre lo odiaba, y estaba llena de resentimiento contra él. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Mitchell, fantástico. Uh, aunque, bueno, es una, es, no es la parte más divertida, <risa> sí, es, es, parece trágica, pero luego eh, le da unos toques al niño dengue que, que sabe superar muy bien su, su condición. Uh, Joseph, would you read, please, for us? Yeah, of course. Um, nobody liked Dengue Boy. It might have been his long beak or the constant annoying buzzing of his wings rubbing together, which distracted the rest of the class. But whatever it was, when the kids rushed into the yard at recess to eat sandwiches, talk and joke, poor Dengue Boy sat alone at his desk in the classroom, staring into space, pretending to focus intently on a page of notes to spare himself the embarrassment of going outside and revealing that he didn't have a single friend to talk to. There were, there were all kinds of rumors about how he got the way he was. Some blamed the pestilent lot where his family lived, full of rusty cans, old tires, and festering pools of rainwater. They said a mutant species had bred there, a giant insect, and that it had raped and impregnated his mother after killing her husband in gruesome fashion. Others claimed the giant insect must have raped and infected his father, who upon ejaculating into his mother had sired the misfit creature, only to run off the minute he got a glimpse of the baby disappearing forever. People had plenty of other theories about the poor kid, but there's no need to go into them now. Whatever had happened when his classmates got bored and saw that Dengue boy had stayed behind in the classroom pretending to work, they were sure to tease him. Hey, Dengue boy, is it true your mom was raped by a mosquito? Ho, oh, bug boy, what's it like to be born from rotting bug scum? Hey, fly crud, is it true your mom's cunt is a smelly hole full of, worms, full of worms and cockroaches and other bugs and that's why you came out the way you did? Immediately, Dengue boy's little antennae would begin to quiver with rage and indignation and his tormentors would run off laughing, leaving Dengue boy behind to nurse his sorrows. Dengue's boy, Dengue boy's life wasn't much better at home, His mother considered him a burden, he was sure of it, a freak of nature who had ruined her life forever. Wasn't she a single mother with a kid? Raising children alone is hard, of course, but as the years go by, a mother's efforts are more than repaid. Eventually, the boy becomes a young man and then an adult, a companion and a source of support for his mother, who in her old age thinks back nostalgically on their beautiful shared past, filled with pride by the accomplishments of her firstborn. But a mutant child, a dengue kid, He's a monster she'll have to feed and care for until she dies. A genetic mistake, a sick cross between human and insect, who in the disgusted gaze of acquaintances and strangers will bring only shame, never once granting his mother the slightest achievement or satisfaction. That's why his mother hated him and resented him. He was sure of it. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think, well, uh, we now is the time to come back to Marta so that uh, we can have the audience ask questions of the writers. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all of you. And thanks, Joseph, for reading so well. Thank, thank, we should thank the translators for their wonderful work. Um, and I would just simply like to first invite the, uh, the, the, the participants, all the people, the audience to ask any questions. There have been, oh, I've got three. No, but there are, there are no questions so far. So I think I'll, I'll break the ice myself. And uh, I'd like to ask Matteo and Mitchell for the place of humor in their, in their pieces, because I think the place of humor in Daenerys' piece is evident. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's a, not just humor, but sarcasm is quite, it's quite, it has a very important role in, in, in Daenerys' piece. But I think there's, a, there's also humor in, in, uh, in Matteo's and Mitchell's pieces, even though they are much darker, the tone of their pieces is much darker and kind of overwhelming. Huh? So what would you say about the place of humor in your, in your or, or irony maybe, um, in your pieces? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start quickly. Um, yeah, no, I love I love using humor. It never it, it's never something that I that I try to do. But I have this theory that that if you if you look at something that is horrible or that is that is terrifying in principle, like like in the novel, it happened with death a lot. But if you stare at the monster for long enough, it starts seeming funny kind of or, or or you or you develop another sort of relationship with with that horrible thing it it, it can be death or it can be madness or it can be you know the, the the infinite universe but i think yeah i think uh literature is a way that we have to kind of uh get intimate with 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 life's kind of horrible things and and i think that yeah that that funny stuff comes from looking at stuff that is horrible sometimes mm -hmm. um i don't know what michelle thinks <laughs> uh, yes something similar first it's the, the kind of literature that i like to read uh, from cervantes to to borges the, the, my most preferred authors have the humor in, in their in the center so yeah. First is like more like a, a reading preference. It's the the, the, the style of, of literature I want to read, but I, I also think that uh, maybe sarcasm um, is an interesting device to to mock uh, the power and um, yes, and try to to critique uh, certain power relations. Um, also in, in in Argentine literature, this like a slapstick uh, kind of grotesque humor. From the Gauchesque tradition to Oswaldo Lamborghini that I love, and I also try that my my writing enters in that in that tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you very much. I don't know whether Dainari would like to mention something about humor, which features so uh, uh, clearly in her in her in her piece. Dainari, would you well, like? Basically, basically, I think that uh, yes, it's a resource that you use sometimes for for telling the worst things that you have to say, and 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 in that way you can you can criticize, you can be critic, and you, and I think that 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 it's, it it also comes from from my tradition. No, I mentioned uh, during the presentation of the issue the, of Granta that I, uh, that I am a a reader, a passion reader of Guillermo Cabrera Infante, but also in Mexico when I was living there, I discovered uh, Iwar Wengoitia, Jorge Iwar Wengoitia, a writer that told me a lot about what I wanted to do with, with writing. And, and I think that I, 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 I like kind of follow those, those, those influences. There, there was a question in the chat for Valerie, I'm so sorry, yes. I was reading the question before. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, all of you. Yes, Francisca Gonzalez Arias, who is well known by us, uh, would like to ask Valerie uh, to, to talk a little bit more about the process of selecting the translators. Were they translators who had already worked with the writers, or, or, or did you know the translators before? Or, or so could uh, you? Yeah, sure. Um, we. we 
I, I paired very carefully um, the translators with the writers. Um, some of them had already had translators that they worked with. Um, for example, Megan McDowell already had three translators on the list. Um, she, uh, so, so she translated Carlos Fonseca, Diego Zuniga, and Paulina Flores, the, the, Ch the Chilean writers, and then Carlos Fonseca. Um, so, of course, if, if a writer uh, was already working with a translator, we um, clearly, you know, respected that relationship um, by all means. Um, for example, Carlos Manuel Alvarez was right, working with Frank Wynn, um, and uh, they, there were a few other, uh, Sarah Booker was already working with Monica Ojeda. Um, but then for the writers who have not been translated, um, I did uh, help do a pairing. I was in touch with the translators first um, and, and talked with them and, and sent them the writers that I thought would be uh, very good for their styles because, you know, if you read translation, translation, since I, I read a lot of the work of these translators, I do know their styles and I do, do know some of their, um, I do know some of them personally very well. Um, and then others I don't know quite so well, but I do know their work. Um, so I was looking for, for pairings. And uh, as I was doing that, I would uh, send the first send the pieces to the writers to the translators to make sure they agreed with it that they could you know do the work in the period of time that we had and then uh that that was really how how it happened um there were some some first uh translators who you know i know work in specific areas like for example jennifer croft who translated Camila Fabri. I know that she works very much in um, Ar with Argentine literature. So I knew that she would be someone for uh, one of the Argentine writers. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Sophie Hughes, for example, who translated Aniela um, Rodriguez, you know, after um, working in with Mexico, she writes, works with so many Mexican writers so successfully. So I wanted to kind of um, work with that. I also, Alejandro Morellon, who worked with, um, uh, with uh, Esther Allen. I, just knowing uh, Esther's taste in literature, I knew that Alejandro would be something that she would appreciate. The same as I said with Michel, um, I, I knew that would work. And I knew Mateo was already working with Robin. The natives, uh, uh, I knew very well that Will was going to get the natives perfectly, uh, perfectly. I know Will very well. And um, for example, there was another writer, Jose Adiak, um, the Nicaraguan writer. Um, I wor she, he worked with um, Samantha Schnee. Mm -hmm. And I knew that Samantha would really uh, capture um, uh, Jose Adiak's style, which is very, uh, uh, a very, he works from the kind of oral tradition. Um, and, and also I like the idea that Samantha, um, she's, she lives in different places, but she spends a lot of time in Texas. And so they weren't that far away because uh, uh, Jose is, is in Mexico City now. Um, then I'm trying Sorry to think of. To interrupt, can I just ask quick? Because there's a question in the chat. Yeah, and there's a little time left. Uh, it's sure. from Joseph. So I think, Joseph, you, you can ask the question yourself. It, it's a question from him but to, to address to the three writers. It was just, thank you so much, Marta. Um, I was just curious how the process of translating um, your work and working with the translator if that informed your own understanding of what you had written. Sometimes the things we write take on a life of their own. And I'm curious how the translation process helped the piece evolve. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I kind of mentioned then when I was talking about the, yes. about the process that uh, we we'll made those characters speak Spanglish. That was something that I've been in, uh, doing in the first place. Uh, uh, and I think that that's, that's very valuable, of course, and, and the way that he was able to keep the irony of the of the of the text. No, that I, I know it, it's hard when you are switching from a language to to the other. Um, yeah, that I, I mean, basically, no, there was a lot of learning from the process, but but mainly those. What about Mateo and Michel, did the translation impact on your work? Yes, I think it does. I think um, uh, 
every every time I've worked on a translation with Robin, I've discovered things about the text because you read it again in English and it's and you sort of discover it anew. So you find things that you that that you know you love because they work so well in English and other stuff that that you you read and you maybe think about it again or you come back to the to the to the original text and revise. But I think it's the part of the of writing that can be collaborative and can be really interesting. And yeah, no, definitely uh, working with translators help, helps the piece grow, definitely. Yes, in my case, well, it was uh, really amazing to see the, the piece in English that it was uh, the, the same, uh, but at the same time, some, something completely different. Uh, the, the main like impact it had the translation is like the, that Natasha changed the, the, the name of the, the a main character that is El Niño Dengue, she put it in capital letters. Uh, we discussed about that and it gave, it strengthened like the idea that it was more like a comic character put it in, in, in capital letters. So I, I thought that was interesting to understand better the, the Spanish version and I also changed it in Spanish, I put it in capital letters. And uh, yes, we had a lot of uh, discussions uh, like that. And yes, it, it was really <clears throat> interesting and new experience to, to see how the translation uh, transformed my, my, mm -hmm. my version. Thank you. I don't know if there, would anybody from the audience would like to, like to ask any questions right now on this spot? Anybody? <clears throat> so let me ask another question to the three of you. Since we are in the United States, well, we, we are, <laughs> not all of you. Uh, uh, well, Matteo is not, and, and, um, and Valerie is not right now. Um, what is your relationship with US literature? Which writers do you feel closest to, if any, or, or could, uh, which writers would you consider uh, influential on your, on your work? Could you, you say so, anything about this? <clears throat> I, I studied English literature, so yeah, I love I love literature in in English. I have so many influences. Like uh, for this one, ev like very evidently, Philip. I love Philip K. Dick and 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 Kurt Vonnegut. I love the tones and the the sort of way of of, of telling stories. But I I like I I started out reading with with Edgar Allan Poe, and then I moved on to the Beatniks very quickly. So not like American literature has always been. <laughs> for me uh -huh. on my side. Okay. For me, beside the classics, I would say that uh, new journalism, the writers of new journalism, like Tom Wolf, Capote, I read those like in a very early stage of my career. And, and yes, they are still very important for me. I, I go back to, to their text like often. Uh -huh. In my case, the, the first like uh, book I read that changed my that, that uh, made myself think that I wanted to be a writer was uh, Faulkner's Light in August. So my, my first uh, influence was Faulkner when I was, uh, yes, uh, when I st was starting reading. Uh, but, but now I would say that science fiction is the, the main influence. I constantly read the, the, new, mm -hmm. the new authors that are mm -hmm. in English uh, literature. And also I, I'm, uh, well, of course, uh, Borges is one of my main influences. He used to say provocatively that he read first uh, El Quixote in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. for me, it's a, um, a really important influence how he uh, twists the, the Spanish more Baroque uh, uh, language to, to the English uh, writing that is maybe more like uh, precise and laconic. And also in my writing, I have like that uh, in mind, mm -hmm. that, that the realization from English uh, uh, writing to, to Spanish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's one question from Alan Sullivan to Mitchell, but which I think we can also ask Mateo and Daenerys. Uh, Alan Sullivan asks, Mitchell, can you tell us about your future projects? <laughs> so, uh, yes. start and then we can uh, <laughs> invite Daenerys and Mateo to tell us about their future projects too, if they if yes. Yes, sure. Uh, as I said, I started like uh, a cartographic uh, imagination with this map that uh, first uh, ended in this uh, text Tenge Boy, and now I'm expanding the, the history and, and the universe of, of uh, this uh, cartographic universe. And I'm trying to write uh, 
a sort of a novel with uh, stories that are embedded in this uh, future. Mm -hmm. And what about Daenerys and, and Mateo? What are your future projects? Well, my immediate project is to finish my PhD dissertation. <laughs> I'm working on <laughs> toward that now, but in fiction, I, I, I have El Album de las Trentañeras, which is uh, the, this true story is part of, the, of, of that book. Uh, and I hope it, it's ready soon. Espero pronto vea la luz. Vamos a ver, let's see. Let's... I'm working on a novel right now. Uh, I have um, a grant from the Mexican government to write a novel, and it's uh, sort of uh, a family drama, and it's gonna uh, it's gonna be kind of horror, but kind of funny, I hope as well, which is a weird combination, but very yeah, Mexican, <laughs> and <laughs> and yeah, basically. <laughs> Okay, just one final question for all writers from uh, Gunter Silva Passoni. And they say there's a tradition of Latin American writers moving to Spain to publish their first novels. Could you tell us, please, how were the trajectories to become writers? Um, I'll, I'll start if you want. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think, um, uh, well, nowadays, I don't think you have to move to Spain to, mm -hmm. to publish your novel with the internet and stuff like that. And with uh, a lot of independent and, and, and smaller publishing houses cropping up, you, you can basically, you don't have to move to Spain. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, um, yeah, the trajectories, I mean, it, it's a long trajectory. I was writing scripts for a long time before I, I published the first novel. So, and yeah, I think there's a, a point where you, yeah, you're writing novels, maybe they're not coming out right. And at some point you get something and you feel that it's right. And that's when you start getting into conversations with publishers, maybe in Spain or elsewhere. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know what the others think. Uh -huh. Uh, yes, when, when, when I was reading the book, I was thinking also like that uh, all discussion about uh, how to write from the periphery, uh, like to, to, to build a universal literature from, from Latin America, not imitating a French novelist or doing something really provincial, uh, is like a discussion that completely vanished, I think, in, in, in contemporary, in our generation. And it's not more that scheme about the center and the periphery. I, I think it doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. um, even more, I was the other day I was uh, reading about how Roberto Bolaño was such a big influence in French literature not right now. So I think now the scheme is backward. Like European writers are actually struggling with, with Latin American influence and not in, <laughs> in backwards. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And I, I just think that we are having basically a similar discussion now about Latin American writers in the United States. So that's something that it's like, it's kind of cyclical, no? We, so I don't know, uh, but I, I, I basically agree with Mateo and Michelle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something has changed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Valerie, I, uh, I invite you to close the, the session. I don't know if you want to ask, ask a question yourself or... or... Or maybe the writers would like to say something to finish, uh, to round up the session. Mm -hmm. well, I can just say no. that uh, that it, it, I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to work with them. I think it's a privilege to have worked with them, to have worked with all of the translators. Um, this was, like I said, really one of the great experiences of my life. Um, having the opportunity to, to, you know, work on a book from, from going from, from, of so many voices, going from the Spanish and bringing it into the English with so many people, you know, in between working with 25 writers and 25, 23 translators, you know, and then all of the voices for the audio edition. Um, it, it's, a, it's been an absolutely gorgeous um, experience. Um, and I want to thank like Jerry Dunn, who's here, who translated uh, uh, Cristina Morales, which was one of the really, really long. Mm -hmm. Hi, Jerry. One of the very, very long pieces um, in the end. And, and it closes the issue because it's the one it kind of packs a punch, literally. Right, Jerry? <laughs> 
and um, Robin is here too. And there are a number of, of um, translators who have, uh, you know, taught me a lot as I've been going through this process. And I just thank all three of you for being so patient with having to be quiet for so long. <laughs> Because I was like, a, I kind of, you know, I, I kind of felt like Francis McDormand um, in Fargo for like months there carrying my baby around and saying, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. <laughs> so it was kind of, uh, kind of um, difficult for them uh, because we came, uh, they had to deliver texts. Uh, we made a pre-selection in August and they had to deliver texts. Um, for the final selection, but it wasn't sure that they were going to get into the final selection. Their texts are what got them into the final selection. And uh, then the translators had to work, and then we had to edit the translations. So it was a very long period of time when we all had to keep quiet. But I told them, it'll be worth it, just just wait. <laughs> that's, that's all. Mm -hmm. OK. Would any of the translators who are here today today like to say anything? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So I think so. Thank you very much. I think I think we can finish here. Thank you so much to all of you, to Daenerys, Mateo, Mitchell, and Val Valerie for for organizing it. It's been a real privilege to be able to host this launching of this really special issue and it's been great to have it, this selection of writers here. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's been wonderful to hear you read. It's been very good to hear Joseph read the translations too. I, I agree that the translators did a great job and uh, hopefully we'll meet here again in the, for the next uh, Spanish language novelists, uh, uh, the, the next selection by Granta. <laughs> and, um, and I wish you all, all luck to the three writers with your, your future uh, projects. I'm sure you will be uh, very well known, not just in the in the Spanish language liter literary worlds, but in the but in the English world as well. Your and congratulations for your for your works. They're just just wonderful pieces. I was reading them last week, and I enjoyed yeah. each each of them. Uh, immensely. They're very different, yeah. but they're all, all marvelous. So congratulate. It was a pleasure to read. You're wonderful writers. So thank you so much. Thank you very much to all uh, participants today. And uh, I hope to see you soon in another event of the Observatorio. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Martha. And, th I, and thank uh, also Diana Sorensen for inviting us. She was here. She thank just you. left. Oh. She was, she's been here. She's been here. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Well, thank mm -hmm. her. Um, and, uh, and it's really, again, the Cervantes has been very helpful um, with this project, you know, uh, and, and Granta also for their enduring interest in the Spanish language um, and their enduring interest in promoting Spanish language writers. Um, because of course, in this issue, it's uh, the case, but uh, they also, you know, they publish a lot of writers also. They publish in the publishing arm of, of Granta, they publish Alejandro Sambra, they publish Mariana Enriquez, who's now on the shortlist for the Booker, they publish Valeria Luiselli, they publish Andres Barba, they publish many, many writers in the Spanish. So they're um, kind of enduring um, uh, dedication um, and uh, also obviously um, enchantment by the Spanish language and its literature is um, very laudatory, I think. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. And big applause to all three writers. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Thank you, Daenerys. Thank, Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you, Mateo. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure.